Hello, church. My name is Crystal Burns. I serve in pre-K and kindergarten and regeneration here. Today our um, scripture is found in Psalm 103, verses 2 through 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Crystal. She said she serves in regeneration, and her and her husband, Kelly, have become my really good friends over the past year, just incredible servants and, and people that, uh, that love Christ. Um, welcome to Cross Community Church. I'm really glad to be here this morning. Here in just a minute, I want to do our typical regeneration intro, but it's a little jarring, I must admit. Uh, but I think it's important. Let me tell you why. Uh, I grew up in a church not this church. I grew up in a different church. Um, grew up in the 90s, and I don't know why, but the the feeling of church, and it didn't, it didn't just seem to be my church. It seemed to be kind of everywhere, was that when we come to church, it should be prim and proper and neat and pretty. And it should be those things. I mean, it should be a good place to come. But at the same time, it felt like it was a place where you couldn't come and bring your messiness, bring your honesty, bring the truth. Um, and I grew up in a, in a youth ministry where, where I was struggling with sin. I was struggling with a, with a weight that was on my shoulders, and I, I didn't know how to express that. I felt such shame and guilt. And shouldn't the church be the place where we can come, where we can seek healing, where we can find new hope and new life in Christ, uh, where we don't have to hide our brokenness, but where we can instead come and be healed. And so at Cross Community Church, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a church where it's okay to not be okay, where we can come and be open and honest. We want to build that culture here. And so here's my intro. My name is Brandon. I have a new life in Christ. I struggle with lust, with sexual sin, with people-pleasing, with laziness, with selfishness, and, I, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to be here this morning. Hi. That's what we say in Regen. Uh, regeneration, if, if, you don't, if you've never heard of it, you're not familiar with it. Regeneration is a ministry that we, we started a couple of years ago. We've kind of been revamping it this year. It's a 12-step discipleship process where we, we come, we meet on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. in the youth room. We have large group teaching, worship, and small groups afterwards. But it's a place where we can come, we can be open and honest with, with others and with ourselves and where we can grow in our relationship with Christ. Yet we identify, first of all, that we have new life that is in Christ. He has made us new. At the same time, we continue to share, even though we may not walk in that sin the same that we used to, we still struggle. We're still humans after all. And so we share with the group how we struggle. We build that culture of openness and honesty. I know that may sound weird and cultish to you, and, and believe me, the first time I heard it, I thought the same thing. Uh, but it's a beautiful picture of, of who we are in Christ, that we are identified by Christ, not our sin, yet we are still open and honest with the ways that we struggle. We're in a series right now that's called Never Be the Same. And this is a series built around the ideas and the steps of regeneration. It's a four-week series. And last week, our youth pastor, Justin, opened us up with the first step of regeneration, which is admit. We must, and this is what he said, we must admit that we are powerless over our addictions, brokenness, and sinful patterns, and that our own power, our lives, are unmanageable. Let me repeat that again. We must admit that we are powerless over our addictions, brokenness, and sinful patterns, and that in our own power, our lives are unmanageable. We have to start there. If we're going to walk the steps of recovery, if we're going to have that new life in Christ, we have to begin with that admission that we are broken. 
for me, that, that was very obvious as, as I was a teenager, as I've struggled with my own sin. But um, as I began my own walk through recovery, uh, part of admitting is sometimes coming at it with denial. Uh, I've been a Christian since I was eight years old. I was very familiar with how I had sinned. I didn't think I had denial. And so as I worked through recovery for the first time, I started to read the admit and steps of denial. And I was almost like, all right, let's get on to the next part where we find the freedom, you know? And so I began to read through those things and came to understand that denial was at work in my life. For me as a believer, denial looked like thinking that I could overcome. I admitted that I had sinned, but I couldn't admit yet that I was powerless over it and that my life was unmanageable. I thought if I learned enough scripture, that if I did enough things, if I read enough books, if I had enough techniques and practices, or um, that one day I would get, you know, be older and more mature, right, and that it would just not be a struggle anymore. I thought I could do it, but I had to come to that realization that my life was unmanageable. If you missed that sermon last week, you can go to crosscommunity.com and click on our sermons tab and, and hear what Justin had to say. It's really important that you start there and then we build this week. Uh, this week, we're going to be discussing the second and the third steps of regeneration. The second step, step is that we must believe and the third is that we must trust. So step two says, Believe that God is the one whose power can restore us. We start with admitting, but then we move on. We must believe that God is the one whose power can restore us. The scripture says in Psalm verse, chapter 103, verses 2 through 5, I'm going to be reading all through the ESV this morning if you're going to open up your Bible app or you have um, something that you're reading along with, or you can just look at the screen. Psalm chapter 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. I love the scripture. I love the songs that we sang this morning. They go right in with this message. Our God is a good God. Sometimes we think of the, this is Psalms, this is the Old Testament, right? We have this idea that, man, God, he was mean and he was wrathful and he was vengeful in the Old Testament. And God is a complex being. We've talked about this before. He is holy. He is righteous. He is just. But listen to what Psalms says about he, that he is also. Let's read this again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. God forgives us. He forgives us of all our iniquity. He heals us of all our diseases. He redeems our life from the pit. He redeems us. He pours out love and mercy on us. It says, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. God is our source of goodness. He is our source of contentment. He is our peace. I love the scripture. I love the picture that it paints of, about who Christ is, who God is. But the truth is, this morning, until we've accepted Christ, until we've ex experienced his life change, we all walk around with a burden that is on our back. We all walk around with something that's weighing heavy on our shoulders, and that something is sin. I don't know if you've ever read the, the Pilgrim's Progress. We've been reading this book in staff, and I've heard about it before, and I've always been kind of interested in reading it, but it was written centuries ago, and just never had found the time. And so we've, we've been reading, I think we're roughly halfway through the book now. And it's about a guy whose name is Christian. It's an allegory of, uh, of the Christian walk in life. And so this guy's name is Christian. He lives in the city of destruction. And he meets a man named Evangelist. And Evangelist 
They, they come into contact and evangelist shares with Christian the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, and Christian places his faith and begins to walk the path toward the, the, he goes through the wicket gate, he stays on the straight and narrow path, and he's, he's uh, making his way to the celestial city, which is heaven. And the, the story is about his journey through life and what that looks like. And right as Christian begins this journey, the book says that he, as he's walking, he realizes, he suddenly understands that he, he's bearing this incredible burden on his back. It's heavy. It weighs him down. It fatigues him. And no matter what he does, he cannot loose the burden from his back. This is a picture of what sin is, of how it weighs us down. Sin is heavy. We are all weighed down by it. We cannot manage the impossible weight and the burden that it puts on us. Our sinful choices, and here's, here's what Scripture would tell us, our sinful choices that we have made add to that burden on our back. Alcoholism, drugs, pills add to the weight that's on our back. Sex, porn, lust add to the weight that's on our back. Pride, materialism, love of money, status, boasting add to the weight that's on our back. Control, binging, lying. We just got done with our Ten Commandments series. Uh, idolatry, stealing, coveting. These things add to the weight that is on our back. Not just the sinful decisions that we make. Others' sinful decisions toward us also add weight that we are carrying. If you've ever experienced, and I hope not, but if you've ever experienced abuse of any kind, that adds weight to our backs. When people have hurt us, and we harbor unforgiveness, resentment, hate, and anger toward others, it adds weight to our back. Even if we're, we're like, I wasn't the one that made the mistake. I wasn't the one that hurt me. Our own unforgiveness and our own hatred that builds and resentment that builds in us adds weight to our back. But the reason that we can't bear it is because we were never intended to carry that weight. We were not created to carry the burden of sin, but to be in a relationship with God. And here's what we kind of got to paint this picture clearly as we walk through this series. When we talk about who God is, about who his character is, we look at the book of Genesis and we see that when God created the heavens and the earth, he created it good. Everything was perfect. He created, you know, the fish, the trees, the, the water, the air. He created man, he created woman, and it was good. It wasn't until sin entered the world when Adam and Eve chose to partake of the only fruit that they were, not, that they were forbidden from partaking in, that they created sin. And so we talk about we were not intended to carry this burden. God created the world perfect. We were never meant to be burdened down with sin. But because of who God is, God is justice. He is righteous. God is holy. He is something other and different than who we are. Because of those attributes of himself, when Adam and Eve sinned, he couldn't just say, oh, it's okay, we'll just kind of sweep it under the rug. It created a debt that was owed to God. The Bible puts it like this. Romans 3.23 says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of that sin is death. Because of God's character, the wages of our sin, the wages of the burden that we bear on our back is death. Because he is just, it must be paid for. Thankful, thankful for us that God is love, he is mercy, he is grace. And we'll get to that here in just a minute. But we weren't intended to carry it. So God looked at our broken state and he decided he was going to do something about that for us. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says it like this. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, you've got a yoke on you already. That yoke is that burden that you wear. It's the yoke of the world. It's the yoke of your sin. It's heavy. It's crushing. It's unbearable. He says, take my yoke upon you. It is easy. It is light. The solution is that we have to come to this understanding that God is the one whose power can fully restore us. We have to come to Christ and place our belief in him. We have to believe that God alone is the one. There's no other religious system that exists on this earth that can possibly uh, pay for the debt of our sin. We have to come to the understanding that there's no amount of good that we can do that will pay for the debt that we have created. No morality makes up for the brokenness. Sometimes we imagine that life is like we get to heaven and we appear before God and he weighs our, uh, our good against our bad. And if our, if our good outweighs our bad, then we're good to go. We're let into heaven. In fact, many religious systems on this earth are built with that idea in mind. But what Scripture says is that there was no good. The, the, the bad that we created w- was so heavy that there was no good that could outweigh it. So God chose to send his son someone that could pay that debt for our sin. We have to place our belief in Christ. God alone has the power. He is holy. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing, all-present, and just. But He is loving. He is merciful. He is compassionate. He is good. He is your creator. And He is, and He alone is the one who forgives sins. He alone is the one that can loose that burden from our backs. We must believe. Third step this morning is that we must trust. We have to decide to trust God with our life and will by accepting his grace through Jesus Christ. You must decide to trust Christ with your life and your will by accepting his grace through Jesus Christ. Let's watch this short story about a man who has believed and trusted in Christ. Hi, my my name is Charlie and I have a new life in Christ. I've struggled with an addiction to alcohol and drugs. I grew up in a middle class home and my parents were Christians and they went to church every time the doors were open. And that's the way I grew up. I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was nine, and I worked in summer camps and Christian camps the whole time I was in school. I thought that God would take care of my needs and desires in life, but it did not work out that way, and I was discontent with the life that I was leading. And I finally just told God that His way didn't work and I'd do things my own way. I started selling drugs to be able to afford my lifestyle, and because the people around me seemed to appreciate me more and like me more. One night I had a revelation that I was a drug addict, but I didn't know what to do about it. Less than a week later, an FBI agent came knocking at my door and said that they were going to offer me seven felony counts worth 35 years unless I cooperated with them. And I knew I could not do that, so I thought my only way out was to commit suicide. So one night I sat down with a gun in my hand and I heard a still small voice inside of me tell me to go put the gun away that he was not finished with me yet. So I put the gun away and went to bed. No one knew about the situation that I was in. But less than a week later, my parents came to call on me and wanted to spend the night at my house which they never did, but they came and pulled an intervention on me, telling me that they knew what was happening and that I needed help. And they suggested a drug counselor. So I went and he offered me a 20 question test to see if I had a problem with alcohol and drugs. 
And if I answered three yes, I had a problem, and I knocked down a smooth 18 out of 20. So it was there that I learned to start recovery and had to admit that I was powerless, which was no problem. And I believe that God could, could and would fully restore me, and I needed to trust God with my life. So I worked through the 30 days there and then came home. When I arrived at home, I started working on myself. And every morning I'd get up and read a passage from the, from the meditation book which they had given me and say a simple prayer. I'd say, today, Lord, I turn my will and my life over to your care. Guide me through this day. I was taught that I needed to live life one day at a time. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I added to my daily meditation time in the Word of God, which would renew my mind. During this time, I had an extraordinary event happen. A friend of my father's came to me and gave me an envelope with $200 in it and said that God had told him I was going to need it. And I was dead broke. I mean, broke with beyond broke. And so I took the money and I said, okay, I'm going to put it in the bank until I need it. And I went to a meeting that night and I put $20 in the basket because I remember the way I was brought up. You should, should give God what it's God's. On the way to work, my vehicle broke down and I had to get it towed into a shop and fixed. Uh, my dad had given me a credit card in case I had any emergencies, but the, the shop told me that they would not accept a credit card or a check. It was cash only. I asked how much it was and they said $180, the exact amount I had in my pocket. Driving away from there, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God would take care of me no matter what was going to happen in my life. Yes, I have been through some tough patches in my recovery and in my life, but I would not be the person that I am today without the time that I spent with my Lord and Savior on a daily basis. Getting up in the morning and praying and getting in His Word, it is the number one priority in my life. By the grace of God, I have now been clean and sober 13,625 days, a total of 37 and a quarter years. It would be my hope that each person hearing me could have the relationship I have with my Lord and Savior. But relationships take work and dedication. My prayer is that you would decide to work on your relationship with Christ. Amen. Yeah. Charlie is one of our leaders in regeneration, and I love him. And he made that choice. He placed his faith, he placed his trust in Christ. Paul says at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2 that we were dead in our trespasses. We were dead. But he continues in verse 4. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5. He says, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved by grace you have been saved what the scripture tells us is that we believe in Christ but we have to come to that moment where we trust in him Trust is simply that moment where we take our belief and we put it into action. We come to understand that God is the one who can restore us, but now we choose to trust him with our wills and our lives. We come to him with nothing. We come to him broken. He knows. He has seen the deepest, darkest sin and the worst that we've ever been in this life. He knows that and he knows everything that's going to ha continue to happen. And and knows the ways we're going to continue to sin against him. And yet he saw us in our brokenness. And he saw fit to pour out his grace and his mercy on us. Scripture says that he sent his son, Jesus, who was the only one that could atone for sin because he came. Jesus willfully subjected himself to the Father. He put on human flesh. He lived the perfect life. He gave his life on the cross. He was crucified on the cross for our sin 
He was buried and he was raised three days later. He was resurrected to new life. Jesus was the one who could overcome sin for us because we could not. And Scripture tells us we must place our faith in him. We must choose to trust in him. We believe that God is the one who can restore us. We choose to trust him with our wills and our lives. For me, that happened when I was eight years old. The first time I placed my faith in Christ. I was eight years old. I was at my grandfather's house. My mom was tucking me into bed, and and all of a sudden, it was the Holy Spirit. There was no other meaning or, or reason for it. All of a sudden, I realized I was a sinner. I mean, I was eight years old. I mean, how bad could it really have been? Yet I knew I was condemned. I knew that I was broken. Thankfully, I was raised in church, and uh, I knew Jesus. I knew that I had a need for him, and so I told that to my mom. Um, She prayed with me in that moment, and I placed my faith in Christ. I immediately felt the burden that was lifted from my shoulders. Go back to the Pilgrim's Progress Uh, Christian continues to to walk down the straight and narrow path toward the celestial city. Um, Along his path, he comes to a hill. He looks up and he sees the cross of Christ. It tells us that he begins to ascend that hill toward Christ, placing his trust in him. It says that immediately the burden is loosed from his back. Um, At the bottom is a tomb. It rolls down the hill, that burden falls into the tomb where it is never seen again. Christ alone is the one who can free us, who can restore us. Faith and trust in him is the way that we receive the forgiveness that he has. This morning, if you've never placed your faith in Christ, today is the day. Place your faith in him. Allow him to ease you of your burdens. Come to him for he is good. He loves you and he wants to know you and he wants to restore you. For Christians in here, you might think, I've already placed my faith in Christ. What do we do now? We work these steps daily. I know from my own experience, I placed my faith in Christ. He freed me. He lifted the burden. But as I walked into my teenage years, I walked into rebellion. I allowed sin, to um, unconfessed sin, to accumulate in my life. I started to add back to that burden I began to be weighed down again by guilt and shame. He had already paid for that, yes, but I was allowing myself to become enslaved again to the ways of this world. What Scripture tells us is that we are to confess. We come, we come and work these steps again. We admit that we are broken, that our lives are unmanageable. We believe that we need Jesus and we place our trust in him daily. Not that we're saved again for the work that Christ did on the cross was enough to pay for our sin now as well as anything that we'll ever do in the future. But we must come to the place, believers, where we continue to admit and believe and trust in Christ on a daily basis so that we do not allow that sin to accumulate on us again, so that we don't become weighed down by the ways of this world. Christian believer in here, I'm calling you to that this morning. Admit that you're powerless. Choose daily to believe in Christ. Choose daily to trust in him, to see that he is good, that he alone can continue to change you and to transform you into the person that he wants to transform you into. Our testimony wasn't just that one time that we placed our faith in Christ. Our testimony is renewed day by day as we continue to walk in him. This morning, uh, I call you to believe Believe that God is the one whose power can restore us. I call you to trust. Decide to trust God with your life and will by accepting his grace through Jesus Christ. Would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I I thank you this morning for a time where we can come together. I thank you for who you are. God, you are holy. You are just. You are righteous. But God, you are love. You are mercy. You are grace. Thank you so much that you have chosen to redeem us. Thank you so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sin. God, we are eternally grateful for who you are. Thank you for your love. God, I pray this morning if if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you, that you would draw them to salvation this morning. God, for believers that are in here, if there's anyone that is burdened by their sin, 
God, may they confess. May they find a place where they can be open and honest. God, I pray these things in your holy name. Amen.